All right, guys, so I'm back with Kurt. Kurt, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Kurt Williams. I'm on uh, the board of directors here at the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum in Salt Lake. So very fortunate to get to hang out with a bunch of cool toys all the time. And he's being a little modest. You've been to all seven continents? Not seven. I got one more to get to in a Land Cruiser. Six continents Six, in a Land Cruiser. So, yeah. You know, you are the definitive expert on anything Land Cruiser. And I thought it'd be cool now that, you know, the new museum's built, phenomenal space, a lot of cool stuff in here. I thought we could focus on a few really unusual vehicles that I don't think a lot of folks out there will know about. Starting with this, which to me looks like a 1990s 80 series Land Cruiser. Yeah, you know, it definitely picks right up where they left off for what most recognizes the 80 series. But the big key on this one, this is a 2007. This kind of doesn't exist in most people's <laughs> mind, including my own for many years. And this is a really unique case, Venezuela only, where they never got the 100 series. So they were make 80 series built in Japan, shipped as a complete assembled vehicle to Venezuela, where it was a very popular platform. Uh, Land cruisers are very popular in Venezuela. It's a, a great transportation, reliable way to, to travel that country that has a lot of austere and remote places. And they love the 80 series. They negotiated through some political processes and things going with their government that they were gonna build 80 series in country using knockdown parts made in Japan. So these were shipped from Japan, so they were still making 80 series parts. Meanwhile, the rest of the world's getting the 100 series, but in Japan only, uh, making the parts, shipping them to Colombia, or sorry, Venezuela, where they're assembled in country as a two, all the way up to 2007. And then they did get the 200 series later, but yeah, a 2007 80 series, kind of, kind of an oddball. Hey folks, today's video is brought to you by salvagereseller.com. This website allows you to bid live on online salvage auto auctions without a dealer's license. You can register for free or use the 20% off coupon in the description below. Go find your salvage car gem now. So I know like Volkswagen has done this with like the Mark 1 Golf in South Africa, um, but that vehicle kind of progressed over the years. I mean, does this thing have airbags and modern safety features? And Not much. In fact, uh, if you crawl around inside, you're going to see everything looks very similar. There are some little different changes. Uh, that we're, we're present in other markets, part-time four-wheel drive, so it's got manual locking hubs. <laughs> Definitely has a little different leather and interior package than others would see. Uh, one of the crazy parts about this one is also not that it's just a 2007, but this thing has 125 kilometers on it. Not 125,000 kilometers, 000, 000 125. So about wow. 80 miles, 80 original miles this has. So very, very low mile, but uh, trim in parts. It does have the quad light system that we did see on other non-US Land Cruisers in the 90s. Outside of that, most of the parts like a knuckle rebuild kit fits. Now, some drivetrain parts like the rear axle did get parts that were more like the 100 series. So a little bigger uh, pinion on the back end, for example, in the rear diff. So uh, Toyota gave them a 32 spline instead of a 27 spline, for example. Like kind of oh, beefed yeah. up some parts okay. to match the 100 series, but overall, everything interchanges. Did they end up getting a more modern engine? Like did they go to the 4.7 V8 that nope. they got? Always <laughs> stayed with those same 1FZ, 4.5 oh liter 1FZ. Yeah, it didn't change. They knew what they liked. And a lot of that was parts available in the country, serviceability and again, the ability for them to send a knockdown model and produce it in country. And the, the 1FZ was still being used in other models. We have a 100 series, a 105 in fact, with the 1FZ also. So that motor lived on beyond the 80 series globally. In the US, we saw it replaced with the 4.7, the 2UZ. Wow, what a cool story. So Kurt, this is something I've never seen before. So these are vehicles in Land Cruiser Heritage Museum, but they look kind of small. What's the story here? Yeah, little different vehicles. We kind of consider most of this row like cousins of the Land Cruiser, or maybe relatives, but not necessarily all Land Cruisers, particularly for some of these smaller models. This first one, the yellow one, is a really interesting one because you see a lot of like 40 series looking characteristics, the hood, the bezel, kind of the, the way the arrangement, but there's really not much Toyota on that. It was built with a, best as can be said, a technical cooperation, but everything about that is kind of other parts built in country in the Philippines by a company called Delta Motors. Oh, interesting. So, built to look like a Land Cruiser, but not really a Land Cruiser, kind of part of that status symbol wanted to have one, but that's what you get. These next two, uh, next three are blizzards. And blizzards were actually built in a partnership with Daihatsu. So they could also be sold as like a Daihatsu Wildcat. There was a handful of other names, but Toyota realizing the need to have a micro SUV for some markets, uh, rebadged these and built them as Toyota blizzards. So there's these little moves. And are they K cars or are they? They're not a K car. They're okay. not like, a, they're, they're, they're bigger than a traditional K car. So they're, these are still in use. I've seen them in Latin America, still in use. I've seen them in Australia. Uh, more like Suzuki Samurai like size. Like a Jimny like kind of thing. Like an early Jimny, yeah. yeah. 
And we, they're important to the museum because you'll see, particularly on like this blizzard, a lot of characteristics of a 40 series, a lot of trade-offs and things and, and keynotes like the bezel once again that has a little 40 series look, but a much smaller vehicle. Now this one, I mean, this looks big. Okay, this is a Land Cruiser. This is an interesting one because this is called a PX-10. This started its life as an HZJ-73, which is a mid-wheel base 73 series diesel wagon, uh, diesel Land Cruiser two-door and was reshaped to look like a modern Land Cruiser. They built very few of these in Japan. This was a special project, Japan only, called the PX-10, done in the 90s, late 90s only. Wow. We've never had it officially confirmed, but had a lot of guests from Toyota that have seen these and saw these for sale in Japan in real limited numbers and said it was Toyota's way of like building a little excitement. And then it wasn't just a few years later when they really started teasing the fact that they were working on the FJ Cruiser. And if you look at the two of these side by side, this isn't a perfect example because it's a trail team with the painted roof, but if it had the white roof, you put the two of these side by side, all of a sudden you're seeing like some similarities. So was this Japan's way of kind of testing the market for a, a heritage styled uh, vehicle that became the FJ Cruiser? Can't say that for certain, but that's kind of the way it was alluded to. Now, but, so, I mean, this almost looks like it was like a, like a kit done afterwards, but this built, is factory. Built by a Toyota, so it's, it is off production, like didn't come out of a full assembly line, but built by a Toyota body company, which uh -huh. Toyota owns. Like, so it was built in a factory, very low volume, low production. So quality of it is very uh, right up there. And a lot of Land Cruiser parts used, the bezel's definitely custom, like that's wider than a 40 series different, but these are 40 series turn signals right off of a vehicle that hadn't been made at this point for well over a decade. So Unreal. they were kind of pulling some stuff out of the, uh, the storage and using it. Now let's keep going. What's the story with these two down here? All right, so this is another one of those really interesting situations where licensing allowed a company called Bondurante to build Land Cruiser looking vehicles, but not a whole lot of pure Toyota DNA. In fact, hmm. while they have Toyota-esque bodies, you'll also see some traits like maybe kind of looks like a Mel postal vehicle top, Mercedes power motors, Dana axles, and they were built in Brazil only by Bondrante, which was like a co-owned company with the government uh, under some licensing with Toyota. And some did use Toyota drivetrain and Toyota axles and components, but not pure Toyota DNA, not built in Japan, but certainly you can see some resemblance to a uh, modern, or what we know as a 40 series Land Cruiser. So I've been told by some people, and maybe, maybe you can correct me on this, but like I've seen a lot of, like especially the later, the front end looks like a 40, Okay. And the back end's a truck. Yep. And they call them Bondurantes. Those are Bondurantes. So, so, so that is factual. Yep. And we do have a Bondurante here in the museum, a truck version. Is that four-door tan one over here? Okay. They were making those into the 2000s. Wow. So you still had this 40 Series S front. Yeah, like you said, four-door cab trucks, which Toyota never made in the 40 Series. And with a full bed, those are Bondurantes. Very Toyota-esque. And Toyota collectors, like, I don't think anyone shames a bond somebody for having a Bondurante in the collection because they're really cool. Right. But not pure Toyota DNA, hence why they're kind of in our peripheral or our special vehicle section over here. So these are interesting, Kirk, because they say Land Cruiser on them. They look pretty modern, but not something that I'd recognize in the US. Right, these are the Prado line. And globally in 1985, the heavy duty Land Cruiser wagon is a 70 series, both short wheelbase and some of the wagon variants split off and you can have a 70 series Prado, a light duty or a 70 series heavy duty. That turned into the 90 series, which turned into the 120, which turned into the 150, and there'll certainly be a newer one as well. Stateside, we see this as the GX. Hmm. So this is a 150 platform, but stateside, this would be a GX 460. We don't have a 120 in our lineup right now, a 120 series Prado, but a 120 would be a GX 470. So that's a Prado. Interesting. Now these earlier 90s, these are the equivalent of a third gen 4Runner. So if you were to hear this fire up, you'd think it's a third gen 4Runner. That's a 3.4 liter 5BZ, sounds the same, suspension parts interchange, but they were available in a two-door Prado or a four-door. And the four-door one here is very, very similar to a third gen 4Runner. In fact, people put the suspension components, roof racks, etc., will interchange. Certainly a different body shape, uh, but yeah, that's kind of that lineup. The US has the 4Runner, globally it was the Prado. So, um you know, and I, I hear this a lot, right? That people say, well, a, a, a foreigner is just a, a Prado with a different top lid on it. I mean, is that true? Are there any carryovers with suspension and the engine? Absolutely. And, okay. This is a four-row gas motor. This is the V6 1GRFE that the Forerunner has had for a lot of years, the same motor. 
So yes, there's a lot of carryover in those platforms, suspension, drivetrain components, axle components, very similar, much like we see between the GX and the 4Runner as far as shared componentry as well. Is there a reason why that one's bright yellow? That is a tollway service vehicle. It's got many miles. I always have to remind myself to look the conversion, 681,000 kilometers, so 442,000 <laughs> miles. That thing ran up and down a private tollway uh, highway system providing roadside service, so it was just driving all day, every day. So that's a 2012 with that many miles is pretty impressive. Now this looks like a Land Cruiser that you'd find in any parking lot in the US, the 100 series, but this one's probably a little special. A little different. Uh, that would be more like these two behind us. This has got a solid front axle. Oh really? Yes. Okay. So, not every market got them. This one happens to be an Australian market, and that's the difference between a 100 and a 105. 105 still maintain that same solid axle that the 80 series have. Very similar design, very similar componentry, uh, but with the 100 series body. Now, one thing I'm noticing too, just from like a quick glance, so our 100 series, and we'll get a shot of it in a sec, Cole, that we got in the States, right? Painted bumpers and leather seats and heated seats and yes. screens. I mean, this looks pretty stripped down. This is a very trim line. I totally invite you to look inside. This is cloth seats. This has about no extra switches on the dash, so a very low trim level with the solid axle. This is factory, non-paint match bumpers, front and rear. It's a very low trim level. Stateside in the US, we were seeing, that's really where 80 series and 100 series were really started to see all those high trim levels coming over. All leather, all power, rare exceptions to that. Uh, there were some cloth 80s, and you could get a cloth 100, but for the most part, they were those higher trim levels, but globally, the 100 series was absolutely still available in a solid axle, low trim level. And this one features that 1FZ motor that we had in the US. It was also available with a, like the HZ, the 1HZ, a diesel model also. So why do you think, and I get this comment a lot on the channel, why do you think that Toyota doesn't give us the stripped down, in this case, solid axle, utilitarian Land Cruiser? Well, we can make all the pleas we want and tell ourselves, I, I mean, I tell myself every day, that's the Land Cruiser I want. I want the solid axle plane one, but the reality is a new car buyer is looking at features and looking at technology, myself included, uh, looking at a new vehicle. The US has an amazing road infrastructure. We have an amazing fuel infrastructure. So some of these models, while as enthusiasts, we're passionate about how it would like to serve our special needs and our special interests for the general consumers and the, the mass population of new car buyers, that kind of doesn't make sense. They want more amenities than this offers. So that's why we get a fully loaded 100 series. And it's quite nice to drive around in these. You know, right. heated seats is a nice thing in the wintertime. <laughs> now, moving on to this 200 series. So this yes. is a vehicle we did get in the States, but this one's a little bit special. Yeah, so this is a Australian spec, and this is called a VDJ200. We got the URJ200 for the entire run from 2008 to 2021. And that ended with the Heritage Series. I know we've, we've chatted those. and such cool platforms, but globally they were available with a lot of different motor, a few different motor configurations, including the VDJ. This has what's called a 1VD FTV, it's a mouthful, <laughs> that's the motor. It's a 4.5 liter twin turbo diesel. Right. So this is a twin turbo diesel motor package. This is a super cool platform. And power wise, it's not too far. I mean, the numbers uh, are certainly different, but like seat of the pants, driving them side by side, which I've been fortunate to spend some time in this one in Australia and a little bit here in the States when it was temporarily imported. It feels pretty similar to the 5.7. In fact, the 5.7 is a peppy motor. I love that motor. And that kind of gets up and goes, but where this one really kicks in is the efficiency of that diesel. Right. So with a factory sub tank, this has got quite the fuel range. Uh, now, so really a neat vehicle. So, so this vehicle is here because of the museum. Correct. Right, so this is not something that someone could import unless it's 25 years Unfortunately old. Unfortunately not, still too new to come over, so this is now here under an official exemption. Now, you can legally bring in a vehicle to the United States once it's 25 years old, working with an importer, or you can bring one over for up to one year on a temporary import. Say you're from out of country or have an out of country vehicle and you wanna travel on that or have a business case where you would need that. But once that one year's up, it would need to be exported. This was a case where HEMA was over here using this vehicle for their business needs. A gentleman named Rob Boheim, uh, who personally built this and drove it all over Australia, brought it over here and then the museum was able to acquire it afterwards, but it has to stay here in the museum. So despite it being such an amazing vehicle to drive and, and use, uh, we respect the fact that uh, that would not be legal, so we leave it here in the museum to share. So Kurt, we've talked about these in the past, but we have to just talk about them again because they're so unique. This is, this is kind of a Land Cruiser. Yeah, it's a cruiser. It's certainly a cruiser, <laughs> but it's a mega cruiser. So okay. not technically a Land Cruiser. Doesn't have the J in the VIN, and it is called a mega cruiser. But uh, part of the history, a lot of shared componentry, a lot of shared parts on the inside. You'll notice if you look at the shifter, steering wheel, window motor. So it's part of the story. 
Now, this was initially designed for the military, right? Correct. So the BXD-10, which is the military soft top version we have next door, was uh, initially used and still to this day used by uh, Japan military forces. And at some point along the way, a decision was made, hey, we ought to make 149 civilian ones of these. <laughs> so very, very limited production. It's not a super practical vehicle by most accounts for anyone. And I can imagine on Japan roads, it was even less practical, <laughs> uh, but a uh, super neat vehicle nonetheless. Four wheel steering, wow. portal reduction hub, so tons of ground clearance. It's got a, it's a really, really big four cylinder motor, a 4.1 liter, which is big for a four cylinder, wow. turbo diesel motor, intercooled. Uh, yeah, really cool platforms. The military edition has central tire inflation on the rear, so the ability to air up and down. So the people that comment, well, the Mega Cruiser is just a knockoff Humvee. Yeah. Is we, that more or less true? Or not, I mean, not really. Uh, th this is how the, the, the really the story goes. Yeah. We've been partner nations with Japan for many, many years. The Humvee is certainly the mobility solution answer for US Armed Forces for a lot of years. It's being phased out as well. Mm -hmm. Japan had to have an in-country built one for themselves. It's not uncommon to see mega cruisers and Humvees in the same theater being used side by side. So it's not an us versus them. It's their solution to the same need, which was a mobility platform for their soldiers. So I've got some really fun photos of like a US hovercraft full of Humvees That's and cool. mega cruisers doing stuff together. So. Uh, not really a copy, just made to fly in the same plane, go up, be lifted with the same helicopter, and be used in the same elements. So we were talking off camera, um, the civilian ones are worth a lot of money. They are worth a lot of money, yeah. yeah. They, traditionally, the last decade, you were seeing them always sell above the 100,000 mark, but maybe 125, maybe up to 150, but the last couple of years we really saw that shoot up, including seeing them break like the $300,000 mark for a left-hand drive converted one here in the States. And um, there's, there's, I think, three civilian versions in the United States right wow. now. So we're not talking many, and about 18 to 20 of the military ones. So I've driven some Hummer H1s before, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're a pretty, what's the word, agricultural experience, yeah. Yeah. right? They're, 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 they're really loud and slow, and I mean, they're amazing off-road, but on-road they, they suffer. Yeah. Is it kind of the same thing with the Mega Cruiser? I would say they're certainly more refined. I've spent a little bit of time in those as well, but a lot of time I've got a BXD-10 that I drive around. I've got plated that I use around town. Wow. And certainly more refined. That 4.1 turbo diesel gets up and goes just fine, but it's really gets up and goes right up to about 55, 60 miles an hour. That's what was made running convoy. The four-wheel steering makes it quite decent prowess, like not bad to turn. In fact, arguably this has probably one of the better turn radiuses out of any vehicles here in the museum because of that four wheel steering. So they actually drive really nice. And the civilian one here, it's reasonably quiet inside, reasonably smooth. Uh, torsion suspension front and rear, they oh, use torsion bars. Yeah, wow. kind of an interesting Lockers? Way. Yeah, locked front and rear, factory is... lockers front and rear. The same exact button as an 80 series. So it's a, so like the Humvees it's have a... like that, I mean, they're, they're like a, they're like a G80 yeah, locker. Yeah, right, right. right. Yep, nope, these are a true factory electric locking differential. You'll, you'll, if you recognize an 80 series locker switch, it's the exact same one on the dash of these. Wow. And they are full time four wheel drive, so they do have a lockable center diff as well. Will they do uh, 60? They'll do, oh, absolutely, yeah, 60, 70 miles an hour, but yeah. right about there, you're wringing its neck to do any passing. So <laughs> that's right on the limit of what they're comfortable doing. And I, I'll tell you what, we'll have to arrange a time for you to come drive one, because I'll make one. it happen anytime. I'd really appreciate that. So Kurt, one of the things I love about the um, Heritage Museum here is all of the different stories that these vehicles tell, and I think that this is a really good example of that. This absolutely tells quite a story. This was an, a very unfortunate victim of the Paradise, the campfire in Paradise, California, that took a lot of homes, that impacted a lot of lives, and took lives a very sad situation, but it's a, an interesting one and a humbling one for us to be able to share here in the museum that we're fortunate to have here, in my opinion, even though it's so different than every other Land Cruiser here. So how did this one end up in the museum? What's the story behind it? So as the news was flashing, this horrific fire rolling through California, this wildfire, the pictures of Land Cruisers kept popping up. And of course, as Land Cruisers enthusiasts, we never miss an opportunity to spot a Land Cruiser in news footage or in the background of anything. And they started uh, showing up. And, Greg had wanted to get one after seeing these, like, hey, that'd be a good tribute to that, and kind of tell that story. And a couple fell through, but he was able to connect with this one through the Land Cruiser community and was able to buy it. And just was planning on getting the 40, didn't know about this amazing story that came attached with it. And that was the owner had had this since new, his kids had learned to drive in it. There was a county sheriff, had bopped all around the county in this thing, all over the trails, very well built, sprung over, power steering. Well, he loved this cruiser. He had just minutes to spare to get all of his belongings out of his house. They were loading their truck up with family photo albums and documents and anything oh. they could. He had planned to go out back and fire this up, 
put it in gear and let it ghost ride right into the pond behind his house. <laughs> he knew the motor would be done. He knew the axles would all need to be drained and serviced, but it would be restorable. Right. It had a dead battery. Oh, come and on. And he had to just walk away from it knowing there's nothing I can do. So moral of the story, have a trickle charger or your jump pack available. You never know when it's going to happen. Wow. But kind of a real humbling thought to uh, how fast things can go sideways. It's true. So Kurt, this is pretty special. And like, I think, you know, people our age that grew up watching Top Gear, right? I mean, you saw a truck similar to this. Very similar. What, what are we looking at? This is a Hilux, but it's an AT44 package built by Arctic Trucks in Iceland. And they build these specially for polar travel. Wow. So as we saw in Top Gear, and in the case of this one, they're made for traveling in really remote ice and snow conditions, such as uh, Antarctica in this case, and this one crossed Greenland as well. So the, you said the only vehicle to cross Greenland. Yeah, it was part of a three vehicle, all Arctic trucks. Yeah. Uh, three of them, there were two AT44s and a six by six truck that went as well and used these to cross the long axis from south to north. It got really loud. It got really loud. Now, um, is this like a CT system? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone looks at these and says, oh, those are never gonna work. You're gonna knock those off with all the trees and brushes and rocks. Well, in those polar conditions, <laughs> we didn't have any of those to worry about. I promise you, you'd have to drive for about three days to run into anything. So they are for airing up and airing down, very important in those conditions, because you would go anywhere from two and three PSI to four and five PSI, which makes a huge difference in your flotation. And that's why they are such wide tires. So you would air them down to get back up on top of the snow, but then you gotta kind of air them back up because otherwise they're distorting and contorting and getting a lot of heat built up and it's hard on the tire. So you'd air up as you drove, just like half PSI changes to wow. get the perfect, uh, get up on plane almost, if you will, and, and get the good running conditions. What's the story with the, the pipes down the side? These are tow bars. So if you ever had a vehicle go down in a really remote place, you can link these up and you can make a train out of vehicles. So, or say you needed to have additional traction to climb things or you, you could put vehicles together. So it's really an emergency device. Unreal. Could be made into a crane. You can use them for other things as well. So is the company that makes these, are they still around? They are, absolutely. Yeah. They're still building brand new ones. They, they just set up US operations in Wyoming. Wow, Yeah. very, very cool. All right, Kurt, so I asked you, what is your favorite Land Cruiser at the museum? And you brought me outside here. Talk to me what we're yeah, looking at. We're hiding it outside. It's just that cool. It has to be hidden <laughs> away. This is a VDJ 79. This is a four door workmate truck. And uh, I was part of getting to go to Australia and build this leading up to our Australia trip. And then this went on to do Africa and South America, including driving all the way back here to Salt Lake. So this was kind of my chariot for a few years and wow. got to build it. It's a factory turbo diesel, the V8 turbo diesel. It's got lockers front and rear, factory lockers. It's got a big fuel tank and really it's got the storage, which is why it has the name Sherpa 2. It was the second one we had, but uh, the newer model, this thing held everything. It was the workhorse of the fleet. And we well, kind of always drove in the back. It's a little heavier than the others, maybe a little slower, but this thing will get anywhere you need to go. So these 70 series Land Cruisers are still in production today. Still in production, you can buy this model. Um, so if you go to like Australia, now I've heard that A, they're really expensive. And a wait list. And a wait list. And it's like even not taking orders. They're, they're very popular uh, as, as motors change. Everyone likes to grab onto the last of the last because they don't know what's coming. That happens everywhere. I think that's certainly happening as 70 series owners in Australia fear the V8 going away. And I don't know that any announcements have been made that it is, but they always want that last one. And uh, they are amazing platforms. Now, Kurt, if folks want to come out here, um, where can they learn more about the, the museum Absolutely. and how to get here? Absolutely. We'd invite anybody to come out. This is the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum in Salt Lake. We're online. You can easily search Land Cruiser Heritage Museum or Land Cruiser Museum. It's open Monday through Saturday. Come visit. You can spend 30 minutes or three hours or a whole day. Some come back a second day if they really <laughs> need to look at stuff. Sweet. So, yeah, invite you all to be our guests. Kurt, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Guys, appreciate you watching.